Today's monster in human clothing is the Canadian serial killer. Robert Picton, aka the pig farmer killer. A pig farmer and serial killer. In fact, most consider him to be the worst serial killer in Canada's history. He was convicted of six murders, but he actually confessed to as many as 49 victims, feeding his victims' remains to his pigs. Welcome to Straight Arrow, a channel where we'll explore the very worst people that mankind, or womankind for that matter, has to offer. During this series we'll be demonstrating that just because Canadians have the reputation for being overwhelmingly polite, does not mean that they don't have the potential for being just as sick as the rest of us. He was born on October 24, 1949, in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia. He was born into a family of pig farmers, which his younger brother and himself started working at a young age, which was pretty common back then. He had a sister which was older, but his folks sent her off to live with relatives in Vancouver. They just thought that a girl doesn't belong on a pig farm. As for his parents, well, they would not win any bloody awards. His dad was abusive, and his mom was not much better. She would put the care of the pigs before even the hygiene of her boys. She'd even send them to school, absolutely filthy, and smelling like manure, which, unsurprisingly led to them receiving the nickname Stinky Piggy. He wasn't all that good in school, so, in 1963 or 1964, he dropped out and started working as a meat cutter, but then returned to the farm to work full-time. Eventually, the Picton boys inherit the farm, but as time went on, the brothers stopped taking care of their farming duties. And they started their own non-profit charity called the Piggy Palace Good Times Society, which they actually registered with the Canadian government in 1996. They said that they would set up special events, like dances and exhibitions for different organizations. These events would be your basic wild parties, or raves, which, of course had to have plenty of sex workers in attendance. As many as 2,000 people would attend these parties. Even Hell's Angels members would attend these events. But, in 1999, the Piggy Palace was closed down. What people didn't realize is that running a fake charity was the least of his crimes. Picton would stalk Vancouver's downtown east side, also known as the Low Track, for his victims. He would then offer them cash or drugs to return to the pig farm with him. And they would not be heard from again. The RCMP and the Vancouver Police Department joined forces in 1978 to make a list of all the missing women. Diana Melnick, who disappeared on or around December 22, 1995, was one of the first cases on the list that could be connected to Picton. There was in fact, 26 missing women that was connected to Picton from 1991 to 2001. There was one in 1991, she was Mary and Clark. One in 1995, named Diana Melnick. One in 1996, she was Cara Louise Ellis. Five in 1997, they were Andrea Faborhaven, Helen May Hallmark, Marnie Lee Frey, Cynthia Felix, and Sherry Irving. Four in 1998, those victims were Kerry Kosky, Inga Monique Hall, Sarah DeVries, and Angela Rebecca Jardine. Six in 1999, they were named Georgina Faith Papine, Jacqueline Michelle McDonnell, Brenda and Wolf, Tiffany Drew, Wendy Crawford, and Jennifer Lynn Firminger. There was two in 2000, that was Deborah Lynn Jones, and Dawn Teresa Cray. And seven in 2001, and they were Patricia Rose Johnson, Heather Chinnook, Andrea Josbury, Serena Botsway, Diane Rosemary Rock, Mona Lee Wilson, and Heather Kathleen Bottomley. Keeping in mind, there could have been a lot more. And what was the secret to his success? Well, the victims he chose actually. Most of them were known to travel from place to place and be heavy into drugs. Not to mention most of them may not have had any contact with their own families for years. So, a lot of times people thought that they either just moved on to another town or overdosed. 
So, how are you supposed to be reported missing if no one misses you? But the increase of missing women didn't go unnoticed. There was even talk of a serial killer stalking the streets. Of course, at the time, the cops denied that it was the work of a serial killer, which led to people accusing the police of just not caring about these missing women. After all, in their eyes, they were just prostitutes and druggies, figuring that they probably just moved on. They could not be bothered to investigate such crimes. They, after all, had more important things to do. Unfortunately, this is not just a Canadian issue, but a worldwide issue. People thinking that just because they were sex workers, that they must have deserved what happened to them, which is total, grade A, BS. They were someone's daughter, someone's sister, maybe even someone's mother. They mattered. There were, however, many missed opportunities to get this sorry excuse for a man off the streets a lot earlier than they did. On March 22, 1997, he took an intended victim to his farm. But when he put her in handcuffs, she fought back. She grabbed a knife from the kitchen in an attempt to defend herself. During the fight, they both received severe knife wounds. She was able to escape and flag down a passing car. They called an ambulance on her behalf. She arrived at the Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster, where she received life-saving surgery. Of course, at the same time she was in surgery, Picton was being fixed up at the same hospital, for the injuries he received. While he was there, an orderly discovered a key in Picton's pocket. The key was a match for the cuffs. He was then charged with attempted murder. The charges, of course, was dropped. The judge decided that her testimony just wasn't good enough to convict, due to her drug use. And Picton claimed that she was a hitchhiker, and she attacked him. While I have your attention, please, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. It'll really help our channel out. Oh come on. You had the bloody key for the bloody cuffs. Anyway, this was not the only chance that was missed. In 1999, during the spring, a police informant reported to the police that an addict named Lynn Ellingson had claimed that she had seen a woman's body in the slaughterhouse at the pig farm. When asked by the cops, she denied the story. At first, but later she confirmed that on March 20th, she did see the woman's body at Picton's farm. She didn't call the cops earlier out of fear of Picton, and the fact that she needed him, because he gave for money for drugs. Then comes Bill Hiscox, an employee of Picton. He called the RCMP and told them that a friend of Picton named Lisa Yelds. She had told Bill that she had seen items that obviously belonged to women on the farm. Things like purses, clothing, and IDs. But, when the cops went to talk to her, she was less than cooperative. That was not the only time Mr. Hiscox contacted the police, but he was told that all he had was hearsay evidence, and that they could not get a search warrant based solely on that. In February of 2002, a former employee of Picton named Scott Chubb called the Port Coquitlam RCMP that he has seen illegal firearms in Picton's camping trailer. That gave them the ability to get a search warrant. On February 5th of 2002, the police conducted a raid on Picton's farm. During their investigation, they not only found quite a lot of illegal firearms, but several items that belonged to some of the missing women. Picton was taken into custody for the firearm charges, which he posted bail for and was released. He was instructed that the pig farm was totally off limits for him while the police continued to investigate. During their initial investigation, they found several items, like jewelry, women's clothing, handcuffs, and an asthma inhaler belonging to Serena Botsway, a woman that went missing in August 2001. They also found blood samples in his motorhome. Upon testing the blood, the DNA was a match for Mona Wilson, a woman that went missing November 2001. Picton was arrested for those two murders. Picton was being held in the Surrey jail, 
he had a cellmate that he thought was just another dude waiting for his day in court. Picton confessed to his new friend that he actually killed 49 women and was disappointed that it wasn't an even 50. But what Picton didn't know was that his cellmate was actually an undercover cop. Surprise, surprise. He confessed to multiple murders to a perfect stranger, and that stranger turns out to be a cop. You just can't trust anyone these days. Picton's farm became the biggest crime scene in Canadian history. The police collected over 200,000 DNA samples and 600,000 additional pieces of evidence. They called in archaeologists and forensic experts for assistance, and they required heavy equipment to move the 383,000 cubic yards of soil while they looked for human remains. Robert Picton's preliminary hearing took about seven months to complete, because of all the evidence and because of how complicated the legal proceedings were. In the end, even though he confessed to 49 murders, he was only charged with the murder of 26 victims. However, he was only convicted of six of the murders. The ones he was convicted of killing. Serena Botsway, age 29, when she disappeared in August 2001, reported missing on August 22, 2001, by her foster mother. Mona Lee Wilson, age 26, was reported missing November 30, 2001. Andrea Josbury, age 22, when last seen in June 2001, reported missing June 8, 2001. Brenda and Wolf, age 32, last seen in February 1999, reported missing on April 2000. Marnie Lee Frey, she was last seen August 1997, reported missing on December 29, 1997. And Georgina Faith Papin, last seen in January 1999 and reported missing in March 2001. On December 9, 2007 he was found guilty of all six murders and sentenced to life, with no chance of parole for 25 years. Now, I know what you're thinking, what about the other 20 victims he was charged with, surely he'll have to stand trial for those, right? Not so fast. In 2010 prosecutors stated that they will not be moving forward on the other 20 charges. Their reason was that it would not add to his sentence because it's already at the maximum. So he killed so many women, fed their remains to his pigs, and what does that bloody dingo get? Life in prison, but still a chance at parole in 25 years. A guy like that should never see the outside of a prison again. But hey, that's just my opinion. Anyway, this understandably caused rage from some of the victims' families, feeling that they have been denied justice. While some of the other families said they were actually relieved that they were not moving forward, it saved them from having to endure a second long and drawn-out trial. As of the making of this video, Robert Picton is being held at the Federal Maximum Security Prison in Quebec. He is 73. This is a man that definitely deserves to be in the pen, with all the other pigs. And I think that is where we'll end our video today. We here at Straight Arrow want to extend our sorrow and prayers for the families of the victims of Robert Picton. And when I say the victims of the families, I'm not only referring to the six he was convicted and sentenced for killing, I'm referring to the 49 he confessed to killing. Out of the 49 victims he confessed to, only six got justice, the other 43 never will. Just because the courts forgot about them, doesn't mean we have to. Thank you for watching, don't forget to hit that like button and remember to smash subscribe. And as always if you want to, you can leave a comment. Or tell us if there is anyone you want us to cover, then, by all means, let us know. And remember, evil has no race, gender, or age.